I mean, yeah. what we're doing in customer experience is we're trying to, to enhance the perceptions that people have towards our product. Right. And to be able to measure that in the form of loyalty and return on investment. While most companies think they've got a good read on what their customer experience is, today's Ask an Expert actually says too often they've got a narrow focus of what that is and need to step back and take a broader view across multiple departments. Hi, I'm Joshua Carlson, co-founder of Propello Media, and today I sit down with Nate Brown. He is the Chief Experience Officer at Officium Labs. They are focused on decentralizing work and wealth, and we'll get into what exactly that means during the interview, but today we're going to talk about how leaders can have their pulse on what that experience is. And give you a hint, Nate doesn't actually believe in throwing leaders into the trenches to work the phones or work the support queue because oftentimes they're ill-equipped to actually do that and they can actually promote a worse customer experience. But he's going to give tips on how they can do that. So I was going to talk about the differences between a single base product business, maybe like an automotive dealership where you're only buying a car once in five years versus those businesses that have an ongoing monthly subscription model. And finally, when we talk about customer experience and improving it, too often we go straight to the clients and what that experience is, when instead we should start first by evaluating what our employee experience is. Now let's dig in and hear what Nate has to say. Nate, thank you so much for coming on our Ask an Expert series. Very much my pleasure. How's it going today, Joshua? Uh, it's fantastic. So thank you for asking. Um, for the viewers who weren't on our pre-call, um, I'd like to just ask you about uh, the belt hanging on the wall behind you. Mm, yes, there, there is a belt on the wall. So yeah. <laughs> it was, a, I guess it was a year and a half ago, Cloud Cherry ran an international CX influencer competition and I somehow won. And in the mail, I got this glorious wrestling belt, which is uh, one of my favorite things I've ever received in the mail at this point. No, that's that's fantastic. I uh, I spoke with a guest, John Rulin, um, and he was talking about the importance of um, gift giving and having artifacts. And you obviously have got a great room filled with cool artifacts. Um, so congratulations on that. Um, this actually leads into my first question, which is, you are a customer experience um, badass, right? It's, it's, kind of, <laughs> it's, it's one that's recognized, um, so I feel comfortable saying that, but I'd like to know where did this journey start for you? How did you find yourself in the customer experience space? Well, thank you very much, Joshua. That's very flattering, and I've never heard, heard it put quite like that before. Uh, Sarah Steely Reed would take offense. She's the original CX badass. Okay. Uh, but <laughs> Duly noted. <laughs> so I, I would say for me, it, it just became a journey of learning in about 2013, just became hungry for more beyond customer service. I love customer service sure. and I, I've been doing it for many years, everything from a frontline agent for years, just taking call after call to working into a management position, but then realizing there's, there's more than just fixing issues. There's more than waiting for things to roll downhill as a problem and started to awaken to this idea of experience design and customer journey okay. and got very excited by it. It was the effortless experience that guided me down that path. Chief Customer Officer 2.0 by Gene Bliss, Annette Franz and Jeff Toyster were mentors for me at that time and still are. And it, it just accelerated my learning and I, I became so excited to be able to give back. And, that, and that's really been the roadmap for me. I, I just, I love learning, I love applying, and experimenting and incubating these ideas. And then from my, from both the thought leaders that are out there that are so generous mm -hmm. from my own experience in trying these things, I like to then be able to give the hybrid of that back to the community. Okay. Um, well, and good for you for giving back. I think that, you know, especially where we are at right now, giving is definitely something that um, is appreciated. Um, and I think it also is an investment um, in, in your future, you know, kind of returns. Um, I, I do have a question that you, you mentioned, you have these mentors in this space. Was it hard for you to get in touch with some of these peers that you looked up to um, that, you know, were maybe the original, the OGs um, in the yes. space? Um, or, or was that easy? It was the easiest thing in the world. Okay. I, I truly believe there is no other function, no other business practice that is like customer experience in terms of the generosity of the people, the, the desire for this field, this methodology to grow and to become what it can and should be. <laughs> I mean, okay. it's still a young practice. I mean, even the CXPA only got started in 2011. Right. So we're still finding our footing. And I think the whole industry knows that. 
And we need to help each other and support each other, especially when we look at some of the stats that are out there around the turnover with top CX executives and the failure rate associated with different CX initiatives. It's like, wow, we need to, we need to help each other and encourage each other. So why do you attribute to that high turnover rate? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a tough line of work. I mean, what we're doing in customer experience is we're trying to, to enhance the perceptions that people have towards our product. Right. To be able to measure that in the form of loyalty and return on investment. And so, I mean, it, both of those are tricky. So both, both the idea of enhancing perception mm -hmm. through understanding what those perceptions are, what does success look like to the customer? How can we position ourselves as a guide, as StoryBrand would put it? The customer is the hero of the story. How can we be the guide and bring them to success? And then how along the way, how can we measure the impact that we have on that customer's loyalty and their share of wallet? Because if we can't do both those things, we don't earn the right to do this work. And are those two connected? I mean, is it, is it a matter of if you get the loyalty, the wallet follows, or are they two kind of separate initiatives? Oh, very much. I mean, the, the share of wallet and the loyalty thing is there in most, in the, in most business models. I mean, if you have any kind of renewal, retention, subscription type of model, loyalty and share of wallet are generally going to go hand in hand, as well as our ability to acquire new business. <laughs> so, I mean, in terms of the word of mouth ambassadorship that is out there, the reputation of our brand, you know, it, Joshua, it doesn't exist anymore, this concept of us getting to tell the world who we are as a company. Right. It used to be we'd slap that on a hot website and that would be it. People would come to us and believe the website. People only believe like 16% of the marketing copy on a website now. What they believe is what one customer says to another. So the reality of our brand promise is our ability to deliver and execute on a great customer experience. That's how right. we acquire new business. Okay. Well, Sage advice um, to put focus on that. Um, I'd like to talk about the firm that you're with because you guys have a tagline that I think is interesting um, about decentralizing, um, what is it? Decentralizing work and wealth. Yes. Um, can you articulate what, that, what exactly that means for you guys? Yeah, so uh, in, in January, my journey brought me to Officium Labs, which is just the coolest organization. It's a CX incubator. It's an organization that brings together the people, the process, the technology parts, of customer experience. We can bring people in, connect them with the best brands in the world in terms of that staff augmentation. We have CX uh, transformation consulting and things of that nature and, and a variety of, of technology capabilities and other things too. So we have all these gaps that we can help to fill. But okay. the idea of that decentralization of, of wealth right. is uh, when, we, when we allow people to have great jobs, great jobs in the customer service and CX realm anywhere in the world, and, and not having to rely on, on those individuals being within 25 miles of a headquarters of an organization they want to work for. Sure. Where we can break that mentality and, and bring these great drops, bring that wealth into these smaller communities and these places that were previously incapable of being able to harvest that type of talent, that type of capability. It, it's amazing what can happen. So I have to imagine, given what we've been through these past several months, this has been a explosion <laughs> for you guys, because I feel like the, the bigger barrier there isn't so much that there's people that want to do it. Yeah. Um, it's that organizations are timid um, or maybe hesitant about opening the doors to that type of business um, model. So what, what have the last several months been like for you guys? No, it's, it's been awesome. I mean, we've, we've, we've done more in these past few months in terms of just making things happen and bringing on some new customers and, and creating new services and just dreaming up some, some great new things that we can do to enhance the CX realm. Uh, it, it's been really fun. I, I love working with Jerry Leisure, our CEO, and the whole team at Officium. It, it has been a ball. But I mean, to your point, Joshua, yeah, I mean, it, it used to be this resistance. There was this uh, perceived incapability of, you know, we don't have the tools we don't have the trust in our people. You know, we can't, we can't let them go out there. We can't just have them work remote. You know, there'd be some concept of a hybrid model. If right. you've been seven years, you know, you can work from home on Fridays. How many contact centers had that, you know, that yeah. whole mentality, which, I mean, it's funny that we used to have those things because we knew it was good. Like yeah. if, if you would use that as an incentive because it, it added a harmony and a flexibility to somebody's life to be able to work from home, and so that would be an earned incentive. 
Yep. Then why would we have held that back in the first place? Right. <laughs> so now, I mean, those perceived barriers have been eliminated. The technology is there. Uh, the, the, the leadership mentalities have evolved so much. I mean, Joshua, it's, a, it's amazing to me how the, the butts and seats manager of, of 2019 is now capable of, of trusting their team and embracing this concept of remote work. I, I can hardly believe it. Yeah, no, it's, it's been, obviously, you know, nobody wants to go what we're, you know, going through right now, but it has been the blessing, um, you know, the byproduct that's come out of it, which yeah. is organizations that have been forced to do it have suddenly come to the realization that they can do it. Um, and are now are looking to say, okay, now we're still looking to continue this, this yeah. uh, model because there's a lot of, you know, to your, to your point, I think that there's benefit from employee morale, um, but there's also, you know, tangible cost savings benefits as well. Yeah. Um, I'd like to talk about CX as it pertains to organizations that might be listening right now. Mm. How do organizations go about measuring their customer experience? Um, and I guess more importantly, how do they go about doing it accurately to make sure that they're really getting a true representation of what that experience is? Yeah, it's a great question. It starts with a great voice of customer engine. Mm. You've got to have the capability to truly understand Going back to the definition of CX, what are those perceptions? You've got to be able to understand the thoughts and perceptions of your customer to the best of, of your human capability <laughs> and yeah. beyond human capability because the voice of customer realm has exploded with, with new technology augmentation. Um, machine learning and AI gives us the capability to bring all these, all these pockets of customer data uh, both recorded calls and, and text responses in the customer service area or any area. Well, I mean, it could be somebody that was struggling with, a, with a, um, an invoicing issue and sure. just, you know, that email, you know, any of these customer interactions, we can now look at the text of those, be able to form a, an idea of customer sentiment in terms of the quality of that interaction and be able to tag and organize that and associate it back into a view of the, the larger customer journey, right? which used to be impossible. I mean, we would do this in such a siloed vacuum of customer service has their data. Here's, here's how we think we're doing because yeah. here's what our post-call survey says. Marketing has their classic NPS score. Here's how we're doing. <laughs> and then product, you know, has uh, whatever they say they have, you know, they have their customer advisory board and they're just making up numbers here and there, but there, there's, there was never a view of the customer journey and where loyalty is being impacted throughout. So now we can measure loyalty in each of these key areas. As an example, customer service, the customer effort score is a phenomenal metric okay. to be able to correlate to loyalty in that area. <laughs> but if, if we want to look at more of a, of a sales or customer success function, something like a customer engagement score or a customer health score, which is like a composite metric, of these different levers, being able to show the health and engagement of a customer. Sure. I mean, that, that's going to be the best metric there that correlates to loyalty. For, for marketing, for brand awareness, maybe it still is NPS. But then at the, at the end of that, you know, at the end, what we want to do <laughs> and what Officium is really good at doing is, is taking, taking these customer service metrics or these more focused metrics and correlating them to actual financial results. Because that's, that's what you have to do is customer lifetime value, share of wallet, renewal retention rate. These are things that directly impact the bottom line. So if we can show, hey, when we improve the customer's life, yep. therefore, they spend more, they spend it longer, <laughs> they, they bring others in with them right. <laughs> to, to grow the, the customer growth engine, as Gene Bliss would say, which is the total volume and value of your customers quarter by quarter, which is another great metric to use. Th this is how we grow the work. Okay, so we've got a lot of different metrics and the beauty of today is that we've got basically computation power to help us aggregate all of this and, and really synthesize it as opposed to kind of these pot shots, anecdotal, you know, I think, you know, at least from my personal experience, it's the squeaky wheel that gets the, um, gets the grease, right? And the reality is, Squeaky wheel may be important or it may not be. You've got to look at the larger picture um, as it pertains to your organization. Well, so sorry. let's just say squeaky wheel turns out to be right. 
The data backs it up. This issue that is happening um, is, is reoccurring and it's one that we need to address. Hmm. What are the methodologies that you guys recommend organizations do to go about correcting areas that they're, they're soft in? Yeah, for, for me personally, I wrote the CX Primer a couple years ago. And I would love for you to check that out, Joshua, and extend it to your folks. I mean, that, that is, sure. is, in terms of a good introduction point to customer experience and, and a good methodology to follow, it'll be very helpful. Okay. And, and it starts with that strategy and leadership portion, yep. which is having a good CX change coalition, leveraging your John Coder wisdom of, of establishing a sense of urgency and bringing allies together. Then you have that voice of customer aspect that we just talked about. Yep. What you're, what you're getting into the zone that you're inquiring is that experience engineering stage okay. of let's make the right changes at the right time. And you have to do that inside of a change management methodology. Okay. Once, once you get the wisdom from your voice of customer engine to know, okay, this is it. This is what will improve the lives of our customers the most. Right. You, you can't go off in some vacuum as a CX team and go fix that, which is the tendency that so many of us have. No, it's, at that point, it's bringing the organization together and saying, hey, we identified a priority that will enhance our customers' lives. Let, let's projectize this. Let's tap into our change management methodology that is a common language that the organization uses across functions, across different divisions inside of the company, so that we can tap into the different talent that we need in these different areas to actually fix the problem. Because if you run off and try and do it as a CX team, you're, you're not going to get the traction you need. You don't right. have the data. You don't have the tools. You don't have the, the influential capability to enhance the employees inside of every different group. You've got to get the leaders inside of that group involved and participating meaningfully before you're going to drive real change. So you're talking about leaders, and I think that what I've seen in some organizations is that leaders are separated from the day-to-day -day customer experience. I mean, it, it's just, it's a reality and a good, I think a good organization, you know, the leader maybe starts there, right? Yeah. Because they're, they're the ones that founded the organization and, and they put it together. Um, but over time, they get further and further away from it. So what are the recommendations to make sure that leaders maintain their pulse on these different departments and, and um, I guess organizational, you know, um, focuses to mm. make sure that they aren't overruling what is actually sound advice. Yeah, that, that's what a fantastic way to, to word that question. I mean, you, you, have to, you have to have the heart of your customer represented in, in every decision that the business is making. Right. <laughs> and however that comes through, I mean, different companies do this in different ways. Eventbrite, as an example, great software company in Nashville where I live, they do a voice of customer forum, just an open okay. house. And they, they focus, hey, Here's a point in the customer journey where we have some friction and we know it. Yep. We have some customer testimonials that we've collected. We're going to show those to you, whether that's a video or a captured experience via WebEx or, or something like that. We're going to show you, we're going to put you in the shoes of this customer. Now we're going to ask, how can, we, how can we brainstorm on this? How can we make this better? Let's do some experience design work. Let's do some UI work. Let's do some UX work, whatever it is, whatever it requires. Let's get our hands dirty and dream up a better experience here. And, and that, that's a cool model because your leaders are, are doing that together with your frontline staff. Everybody's on the same level. Sure. Everybody gets to dream and participate in this. So, so it's great. You know, one of the things that uh, Medallia kicked off uh, with using their voice of customer software is just um, having it be really easy to start each meeting with a detractor statement and a promoter statement. You okay. just come into the meeting, you pop it up, you literally hit a button in there and it's got, it just randomizes. Here's, okay. here's one of our detractors, here's one of our promoters. Let's encourage each other with the great things we're doing. Yep. Let's also be real with each other on the things that we could do better for our customers. So I mean, that, that type of thinking, if you begin your executive leadership meeting with that type of moment of truth yep. to get into the, the mindset of your customer, then you're, you're going to make good decisions. Okay. And do you recommend for leaders um, when you guys are working with your clients, do you, I mean, obviously that's a great dashboard, right? That's a great meeting um, precursor to get the, to get the pulse, you know, going, but do you guys recommend that leaders 
jump on the phones for a certain amount of the, uh, you know, let's say an hour a month kind of thing, uh, or maybe, you know, go hang out in the customer service bullpen so you can hear frontline exactly what's hearing um, or go talk to the product team about, you know, maybe it's returns or product suggestions that are happening. Um, what are you guys' recommendations um, to really pull that leader? Cause I just, I feel like I know I've been in organizations where the leader knew it, but the yeah. business is now 30 years old, right? It's changed. Yeah. Right. And so what they think and what's happening today can be, can, can be different. Yeah. Well, I'm going to give probably a non-popular answer to that. So ah. I, I've, I've always loved the idea of let, let's make our executives go sit on the phones. Sure. I've never seen that actually work. Okay. <laughs> there's always, there's always logistical problems. There's, there's always un, unanticipated elements to that, that, that is not a great experience for the customer. Yeah. And it's actually not a great experience for the executive to okay. sit there and take five password calls in a row or, or whatever it is. Yep. So unless, unless you have the unique ability to, to make that a really seamless experience on both to sides. Actually do the job well. If, if that's easy for you and you've got yeah. a tool set that facilitates that, lovely. Okay. For the rest of us, and, and as an example, we, we're working with a um, Fortune 10 co a customer right now, a huge gaming organization, who uh, when, when we want to reintroduce uh, the player experience back into the studio, We've created this persona template mm. of, of here's, here's what your gamer loves. Here's the way that they're playing the game. Here's what would make this player experience better to make them play deeper and longer into the game. But then two, we have a video. We have this video that we're creating on each of the different personas which, with these incredible <laughs> testimonials about yeah. the ways that they're inter engaging with the game and engaging with other players. And so, I mean, that's jumping off the page, right? And so we can use the combination of this persona template and this video to be able to really uh, inspire and engage people to care about their, their players yep. internally in, inside of the studio and, and to just wake some people up in terms of, wow, you know, this, it's a very uniting thing to, to, to be able to look the player in the eyes, look the customer in the eyes. Yeah. And, and this, is the, this is the problem. We can't sit here and debate it. Because so many of our internal meetings get derailed around what is the problem. And, and we just end up squabbling about what the problem is. When the customer sit, sits there and tells you exactly what the problem is, that debate is gone. And right. you get to jump right into how can we make this better for them? And that's a far more uniting conversation for your leadership team than what's the problem. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious, as you guys have worked with clients, um, I feel like – uh, as a lay person, um, I feel like there's kind of two facets to maybe the customer experience. Um, there's the actual product or service itself that they are, you know, soliciting. Um, and then there is the, um, the physical, the, the actual experience in how that product or service is actually utilized, accessed, followed up on. Um, how often when you talk to organizations, do you say, hey, you've actually got a root product problem? You know, your product is no longer representing what the customer needs versus yeah. you have a fantastic product, but for the life of the customer, they cannot figure out how to actually use it well. Yeah, it, it's far more often that we're going to be engaging on, on the second path. Okay. Of there's, there's a heart here. There's a product or service here that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here right now. Yeah. <laughs> If, yeah. if you, I mean, it, it's table stakes. The, the, the cost of entry is having a great product or service. Yeah. If, if, once you've done that, now uh, the competitive differentiator is wrapping that up. I mean, I, I, love, I love what you're saying here, Joshua, around, yeah, there almost is an experience inside of an experience. Right. There's the obvious product or service. But then wrapped around that is, is the experience of the experience. Which is, which is very much where the perceptions are created. Sure. The, the darn thing could work. The service could be okay. But your, your perception is going to be modified and created as much by the wrapped around experience of, of how that was given to you, <laughs> yep. how, you were, how you paid for that, how you, you were supported in that experience as much as the actual product or service. Very much. Okay. 
Okay. Um, well, we're a marketing agency, so love to always, you know, get a little bit of marketing um, insight here. So mm -hmm. from your perspective and the customer experience, what is the role of marketing to make that as great as it can be? Oh man. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to show off, I'm going to show off my pink Crocs to you. Ah, all right. So this to, to all those out there that are marketing people that are trying to marry marketing with customer experience. There is no better book in my opinion than fusion. Okay. Although I do love, I'm reading marketing rebellion by Mark Schaefer right now. Yep. That's a pretty cool one too. But uh, Denise Leone has a, has this gift of being able to bring the concept of like the brand promise and, and what it is that the organization uniquely is delivering to the world. Right. And, and how that, that has to be supplemented and made real by the customer experience delivery. <laughs> So th these things come together. I mean, and that's the reason that we see so often, uh, even, even ahead, uh, an executive who has both the CX and the marketing function together or seeing CX as a part of marketing. It's because we, we don't get to sit out here and make this brand promise and tell the customers, this is what we do. We, we, we can no longer set an expectation with the customer in marketing that can't then be sincerely and authentically created through the actual experience design. <laughs> right. And so how many organizations that you guys work with, um, I'll just keep it as simple as oversell what it is that they, they provide to their customers. Oh, I mean, we're, we're so burned on crappy expectations. Right. I mean, that, that was, that was the reality of, <laughs> of most of the last century. And, and that's the reason that marketing and, and forgive me if, if this is, me speaking ignorantly, that's the reason that marketing has had a very bad reputation is because they have made things up because that's their job is to put the lipstick on the pig and create a narrative and then leave. <laughs> so now though, though that's not working anymore. <laughs> Customers have, have wised up to that approach. Now, so great quote from, from a guy to wine tasting from, from in moment. Um, it's what one customer says to another. So, I mean, the, the reality of marketing is not under our control anymore. Marketing is being done out into the world. We are, we are simply beginning the process, setting, sowing a seed <laughs> and putting yeah. an expectation out there and then, and then hoping that the world validates the accuracy of the expectation that we made. Because if that doesn't happen, we're not going to be around long. <laughs> yeah, no. And I think that that's fair. And I, I know whether it's marketing or it's sales, um, we all as customers immediately can sense um, it's the BS meter, right? We, we start smelling it pretty quickly. Um, and so really, I feel like a word that I've heard resonating um, with several of our guests is being authentic, be authentic to who we are. Um, and I think it was Howard Bihar, um, former president of Starbucks said, uh, you may not like the culture you have, but it's the culture you deserve. And so I bring that up because it's a really <laughs> profound quote that I think can resonate across any, um, any department that we are talking about or any function. And in this instance, I feel like you may not like the customer experience you have, but it's the one you deserve. And so if we're having to glamorize, yeah. put lipstick on the pig, then really we need to put more emphasis on what the pig actually looks like to start with. And marketing won't have to overextend or overreach. Yeah, very, very well stated. I mean, it just, it, it's got to be there. I mean, yeah, the, that word authenticity is being used a lot. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think it's good. I mean, I think it's been a, a great wake up call over these past few years. And it is the, the good authentic brands that are gobbling up that market share. Right. But in terms of, okay, so that's a nice word. How, how do I be authentic? Well, let's start sit down and think about what makes you distinctive and unique. There, there is something your, organi your organization does that nobody else can do as well as you. <laughs> right. you, you have, you have a, a unique and distinctive purpose and a niche that you can fill better than anyone else. Draw power from that. Be, become the embodiment of, of that focused element of what you can bring to the world that nobody else can. Build your culture around that. Build your experience around that and build your real marketing around that. And if, and if you haven't discovered what that, what that little thing is, that mustard seed that can grow into a giant tree, yep. then, then seek it out. 
It, it starts with that very crystal clear concept of what you can do better than anyone else can. Start with why, Simon Sinek. <laughs> wow. Good, good reference. Uh, so let's talk about um, storytelling because I've, I've seen a, a quote or a reference that you talked about how marketing should be focused on storyteller or we should be focused on storytelling marketing. What mm. is that comprised of? How do we actually develop that? Yeah, I mean, I, I love, I love the, the story brand methodology of, of embodying the, the voice of the customer and being able to tell the customer's narrative when, when they can't be there. And uh, it, storytelling in, in the CX world historically has been pretty boring. Okay. It's been, here's the survey results that we got. Yeah. And you know, that's not going to wake anybody up, but we have all this new voice of customer capability and, and the ability for us to bring the customer into the room virtually and in, in different ways now that, that, that is really unique and exciting. We should, we should leverage the, that, that new technology, those new capabilities um, to really allow the customer to tell their own story. But then when they can't, let, let's be excited. Let's be compelling about the way that we tell the customer's story. Let's get people inspired and energized to want to serve the customer better. Sure. I mean, the first thing in that John Coder leading change methodology is a sense of urgency. People have to want to change or they're not going to change. Give them a, a really good reason. <laughs> we, we can do this better than anybody else in the world. Our company can do this. We're failing to do this because, and here's what our customer's impact is. They are not able to be successful. We're not the best guide that we can be for them because of this barrier. We, we have to eliminate this for the good, for, for the edification of our customer. We have to be the, the best guide that we can be for them. So I think when we talk about customer experience, the type of business that we commonly think of is the reoccurring business, right? It is the membership. It is the you know, ongoing service that we pay a monthly fee for. Um, but that's not the only customer experience, right? We have businesses, uh, we can take automotive. Um, I go and I purchase a vehicle and I'm probably not going to be back at that, that lot for another five or six years. Sure. Let's talk about the differences between those customer experiences and what should happen after that initial transaction. Hmm. Yeah, I love, I love developing a tool called like a listening map, okay. which is where you're thinking about what are the structured like surveys or, or other channels that we create as a business? What are the structured and unstructured channels in which customer feedback can happen throughout that journey? And the deeper your relationship with the customer the more intimate those, those channels should become. And so if, if you're my surgeon, Joshua, <laughs> and, and I'm having a, a major medical thing, like I, I need to know that I'm going to be okay. I need to know that you're thinking about me and that you're, you're meditating on the best ways to take care of me. Sure. And there's going to be some deep conversation there. There's going to be a development of that strong relationship that's there. But if, but if I'm buying, um, if I'm buying Vitafusion men's gummies from you, uh, I, I don't need quite that depth of relationship, but I, I need a really quick and easy way though, to be able to give you feedback on how tasty or chewy this vitamin is. So, I mean, the, the, the depth and, and the, the depth of that robust voice of customer engine yep. or, or maybe not so robust is going to be determined by how, how deep that customer relationship really is and should be, in my opinion. So let's take the surgeon one. Um, I uh, got no knives here, so I'm not a practicing <laughs> surgeon. I just pretend <laughs> to be one on, uh, on this today's interview. Um, obviously, I get where you're coming from because it, it all makes sense. And, you know, the, um, the magnitude or the gravity of the, um, the service being rendered requires yeah. a higher level of care and you use the word meditating on, you know, what is the best way to take care? Um, but I'm gone and hopefully, well, actually, hopefully you're gone, right? I fix whatever procedure yeah. we have to do and <laughs> hopefully, you know, we never have to cross paths again uh, because you're healthy and you're, you're on the way. Um, but there is an opportunity for you to talk to your friend, your colleague, exactly. your peer yeah. that says, I too was having back pain and I went to Dr. Carlson and he mm -hmm. was phenomenal. Yep. So yep. is there a, a post-transaction kind of um, drip 
program you recommend um, to, to stay in touch? Yeah, no, I, uh, I love what you're, what you're saying here. And uh, I'm going to use the example of Carvana. Okay. So five years ago, I bought a car from Carvana. Yep. And I had a remarkable experience in that. And uh, they even gave me this giant token that I was able to drive to the Nashville facility and use this token to put it into this machine. And my car comes out of this vending machine for cars. And you know, it was, it was a, a pretty magical experience, but also sure. a very effortless experience. They, they combined a lot of great elements here in their experience design. So then began uh, the, the feedback loop. You know, they got all the feedback. I love my experience. Then they, they flipped me into more of an ambassador category. Hey, Nate, we'd, we'd love if you'd refer us mm. to a couple of your friends. By the way, uh, here's, they, they mailed me some really nice cards <laughs> okay. to be able to give to like five people. Like it wasn't like 100 cards I'm going to yeah. throw away in the garbage right away. It was like five really nice printed cards. Okay. And, and I ended up referring two people mm. that went and bought a car from Carvana. Right. So definitely became an ambassador for that experience. And so then, you know, they, they thanked me, they incentivized me for that referral. Uh, I mean, so they flipped me from, from somebody who my dad thought I was insane for buying a car that I'd never seen before online. Yep. They, they got me there. They got me to the, to the magic vending machine and, yep. and I, I bought the car and then they turned me from that a little bit scared consumer <laughs> who took a risk on a new experience. Sure. They, they moved me all the way into this vibrant ambassador for somebody that, that just speaks very, very fluently about the services that they can offer. Yeah. Uh, is it, I'm excited to do that. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm going to act as their marketing team for them. Uh, <laughs> that's what we want to create. So it sounds like really what I'm hearing is it's easy to go out and solicit those referrals if we did a really good job with the experience in the first place. Right. It's like if you if you master this, it's not a reach to go out and ask the customer, hey, if you know anybody. And obviously they gave you the tools to be yeah. able to, you know, do so in a very, you know, professional way. Um, what what is the just the the process? If if we you obviously work with a lot of organizations, but if, if the businesses are sitting right now, how do they just think about creating a better experience like is there you know i feel like some people maybe sell themselves short like that idea that token that vending machine to your point it's not terribly complicated but it was creative yeah, and yeah. creativity is a struggle so what are the what are the methodologies or the recommendations you have for organizations to get creative to push the boundaries push past the boundaries to come up with something that's cool um, and like you said it's it's easy but it's cool and creative and that's the struggle for companies. Well, I mean, well, a lot of organizations can develop a community around their brand. Okay. And, and your community of loyal ambassadors are, are going to be a, a ripe harvesting ground of creative energy for you. They're going to be giving you all kinds of ideas that you yourself could never come up with because they're actually using your product and service and they're your most loyal customers in the world. So tap into that community and bring those people together and, sure. and incentivize them to incubate new ideas for you about, wow, this would be incredible. So you'll have a never ending stream of, of concepts and ideas coming from your customer community. Beyond that, I mean, I, I think that leaders sit around too often, stare at each other and, and think that the room of leaders is going to come up with the, all the ideas. Right. Where, whereas, I mean, if you, if you invited your staff, <laughs> Yeah. To, to really be a part of that and to get some excitement and energy around that customer experience design concept like Eventbrite does through that, that open forum. Sure. I, I mean, Courageous Cultures, a book by Karen Hurt and David Dye, talks about all these ways that you can leverage your, your entire staff at every level to give you new innovative ideas and to push customer experience design and, and everything else. <laughs> Just push the, the employee experience, the brand experience, push it all forward by, by getting your people truly motivated to do that. I mean, there's a, a great Bob Thompson quote talking about how we, we paid, we paid for everyone's hands and they're sitting out there pushing the buttons or, or whatever they're doing. They, they would have given us their heart. If we had just asked, <laughs> they would have given us their mind and, and their heart. 
right. but, but all we could think to do is just pay for their hands. Right. We, we can do more. <laughs> So it's just a matter of not being short-sighted, um, especially with the toolbox you have. I, I think I've popularized, I know from a lot of my past employees, uh, work with the tools you have today, uh, design the toolbox you want tomorrow, but the reality is a lot of organizations actually have more tools in their war chest than they actually realize. Yeah, it's out there. It, it exists out on the floor. It exists now in the, in the homes of your people. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> it's something like Spigot, uh, which is like an in, a virtual innovation tool that gets people like excited and collaborating on new ideas and brings a lean Sig Sigma component to it. So it's not just a field day of ideas, yep. but you actually get like incubating pockets of, oh, that's a great idea. That's similar to what I thought of. Let yep. me jump in with you and let's work together on that. Because I mean, that that's what you want sure. instead of everybody come draw up three to five ideas and send them to us in an email. Right. It's not going to go anywhere. But it, but it, one time we did, we did like a mini shark tank inside of our organization. We called it gig global innovation group. Okay. And we did like a half day of just creative thinking and problem solving skills. And just here's new ways to think of challenges and problems. Then we slapped the whole, the whole gathering is a big virtual gathering across the world. Yeah. Gave them all a set of voice of customer data and, and like employee experience data and said, here's some challenges. Let's pick out some themes in this data that we have. And now what we're going to do, we're going to break you up into some small groups and we're going to use these skills that we taught you to sure. think about a creative solution to this problem. And then the, the, the small groups then brought back their solutions to like a shark tank panel of leaders Yep. who could then invest in their idea and become the executive sponsor of that idea. Right. And, and it was, it was such an energizing forum. I love it. It's just thinking differently. I mean, it's changed the paradigm. Um, yes. it, it, you're going to get freshness from something that was, you know, two minutes ago stale. Um, is there anything else that we haven't covered that you think would be good for businesses to know right now? Yeah. I mean, one thing that I haven't mentioned enough is the fact that, this entire, this entire customer experience journey really starts with a great employee experience. Mm. I mean, that, that's going to be the foundation of this. And, and if you don't know what your employee experience looks like today, I would highly, highly recommend that you do something like a pulse survey program. Okay. Not, not an annual survey. <laughs> that's, that's not going to give you the real time information you need to be able to, right. to make decisions and know how things that are happening are impacting your employee population do something like a, a regular pulse survey program and dig into that first and understand how you can get your own people to be ambassadors for your company before you're trying to make your customers to be ambassadors for your company. Right. So that, that really is the foundation. And, and again, you know, fusion, great book for that prime to perform another incredible book to identify the motivators that are out there, that the motivators that make people work really well yeah. over time and those things that steal our energy away and take our creative capabilities away, identifying how much of those motivators exist, enhancing the positive motivators, decreasing the negative motivators so that we can ultimately create this experience that we can then give to our customers and be very proud of. So start your journey there and then move into that customer experience methodology as found in the CX primer or your favorite CX resource. I love it. It actually reminds me of, um, I think it's, you can't outwork your diet. Um, no, as you're yeah. talking about physical health is that, you know, it is, it's multidimensional and it's great to work out, but you know, it starts first with what's going in. And I love that because it really, you can't expect your employees to deliver great experience if they're not getting a good experience. It can't happen. It's, it's one of the most shallow pursuits in the world. I remember we had a program at one point where we were trying to get people excited around voice of customer okay. and giving us more voice of customer insights uh, based on like phone calls and emails that they got. And so we, we gave everybody like a button, like a USB web key button okay. in the customer service area and said, Hey, when you get customer feedback, hit this button. And it, it took them to this really easy little portal. What, what happened to this customer? How'd they feel about it? And we were able to use um, a, um, a customer first meeting to unpack that and learn from that feedback that came in. It worked well. But then uh, we started to expand beyond the contact center. I gave out this button to somebody in the sales team 
And she goes, oh, that, that's interesting. Where's my button? I was like, oh, uh, I, didn't, I don't have one for you. And she's like, you know, I, I feel like I've got a lot of ideas and a lot of things that, that maybe you should care about before we're so worried about our, our customers' ideas. It's like, gosh. <laughs> and I mean, it, she's exactly right. Like I, I totally skipped that yeah. stage right. of, of the customer experience design by first doing the same thing I'm, I'm building for my customer, doing that even more for my employee, right. building that for them first so that that can then be the cornerstone for what we build for our customers. I love it. Yeah, no, that's uh, tough to hear, um, but it's great. It's great feedback that obviously you've, you've implemented. And, um, and so thank you very much for sharing because um, I think a lot of organizations miss that. So that's a great, uh, great point to end on. So uh, Nate, I want to thank you very much for coming on. Um, love this, love this theme. The customer experience is one that um, has been in the shadows for far too long. And I'm glad that you and organizations like yours are coming out and are really benefiting because contrary to, I think what a lot of business owners may think, there are financial gains to be had from it that are multi-dimensional. Oh yeah. You know, increased, like you're saying, lifetime value, but also I love the concept of being able to have a happy customer that goes out and speaks on your behalf. They become that marketing department for you. So mm -hmm. a lot of great stuff today. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. My pleasure. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.